else around I'll hold you down I'ma always be right here yeah, I'ma be right here Hey guys, I'm not actually very good with technology and I always find that when I come here the technology is all a little bit all over the place. So I kind of feel like Jesus is on my side with this one. But anyway, Amish rant over and out. Thanks, Abby. Um, so you guys, you've been looking at um, the Gospel of John. You've been doing a series in it, is that right? Um, and so have you looked at the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine? Love it. Um, some of the healing stories, the feeding of the 5,000. And tonight we're going to be looking at Jesus walking on water. We're going to be looking at Jesus walking on water. And, and I guess in this time I wanted to bring a challenge to you guys around that. But as I was preparing for this talk, I also felt like God gave me a little gentle picture in the mix too. So we're going to have a challenge, we're going to have a gentle picture, and then I'm going to invite my friend up, Dan, who's come with me tonight, and he's going to share a testimony that felt fitting with tonight's um, message. So that's where we're heading. Prepare yourself for the ride. <laughs> um, now we're going to uh, look at some scripture just to kick us off. Um, I've got a little confession. We're actually going to read this story from um, the Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> Just sorry, sorry there. But he, he kind of elaborates on the story a little bit more. And also we get to see Peter's response to it. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I love Peter. Kind of, yeah, I get his fumbliness, his heart. Um, we don't want to miss out on Peter's response to Jesus walking on water. So if you have your Bibles, your phones, Bibles, um, Bibles on phones, <laughs> Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33, we're going to be looking at. Okay, so from verses 22. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him, they were terrified and said, is it a ghost? And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, don't be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Amen. Now, um, when Matt sent out a list of the miracles that we were going to be looking into, this um, Jesus walking on water, it jumped out to me. And I actually had it read on my um, wedding day as part of our service. Martin and I chose this one. We weren't, really, we weren't really thinking about this one as such, but my father-in-law suggested it. I remember him saying he doesn't quite understand why it's not a more popular wedding reading. Now, when it comes to a wedding day, I don't know if any of you guys got married or been part of it, Lots of people like pitching in their ideas, don't they? You know, are you going to have an organ or a, that guitar-led kumbaya or worship thing? That was one that went down in our household. How about which wine do you want to go for? Which caterer are you going to have? Which specific material are you going to be using for like the bunting you're going to hang up in the hall that needs to be sent off to your great auntie to be sewn up together? How about the flowers? Which flowers are you going to go for? This was an important one for me when I was in my bridezilla mode. And um, I remember I was going for the rustic romance thing, rustic romance, and I told this to my florist, you know, I'm all about the rustic romance. And so she very sincerely showed me a photo of a bouquet with a cabbage in it. And I was like, no, no, that's too rustic. <laughs> so, 
so there's lots of ideas that get put into the equation. Um, some go well, some end in ridiculous family arguments, but it's a, it's a glorious affair. But when this idea got mentioned from my father-in-law, my lovely, lovely, lovely father-in-law, I was like, this is a no-brainer. I want this one to feature on my wedding day. Because I guess that this is a story, and it is a story, which brings that faith-filled challenge around adventurous living with God. And, you know, in this passage, we see Jesus walking on water and bringing us into the invitation of that. How exciting is that? You know, when Marty and I got married, we didn't, we didn't want to settle for a comfortable life, an easy life, an insular life. We, we didn't want to settle for a lukewarm faith. We felt drawn to this picture of Christianity, this expression of Christianity, which kind of went for it, that said to Jesus, you can have our all, you can have everything. You know, we, we want to love you well, we want to love the church well, we want to love one another well. Lord, lead us to the, the last, the least, and the lost. We want to live lives where we're not just kind of doing it in our own strength. We want to live lives where we're dependent on your spirit to carry us in the mad old adventure of life with Jesus. And we want to go water walking with you, Jesus. And 11 years down the line, it's our anniversary next Saturday. I'm not actually going to be around for it. My friend Dan's actually hanging out with Marty. But <laughs> so you better look after him. <laughs> But yeah, 11 years down the line, it's been a bit fumbly at points, but we are still drawn to that picture of, you know, water walking with Jesus. We're still deeply, deeply drawn to it, and we're shooting for it, even if we stumble along the way. So I wanted to dig deep with this passage again. Um, and in my preparation, I knew there was a book out there by John Ortberg, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat. So I bought it. I hit Amazon. I'm diligent. I'm diligent in my prep, guys. I got this book. And in this book, Ortberg, he, he goes there. He, he goes there with this inspiring uh, kind of invitation that we see in this story. You know, in this story, the disciples, they had been sent out by Jesus. Um, by Jesus while he was having some alone time with the Father. And in that time, they get caught in a storm. And they would have been scared, they would have been frightened, they would have been huddled together, clinging together, maybe clinging to their own prayers, who knows. And then the story tells us that the fourth watch of night, which would have been around 3 a.m., so that was some time riding out this storm, some time they had to wait, Jesus walks by. And they see this man walking on water, and they don't really recognize him at first. They're like, who is this creature walking on water? This is madness. And yet Peter, Peter, oh, I love Peter. He, Peter, like, who has this precious faith, who, who believes who Jesus says he is, he starts to see maybe, maybe this could be our God who's come to save us and rescue. And so he says, Lord, is this you? Is this you? If it's you, Tell me to come. Like Peter, with the waves crashing around them, he's in this like mini discernment process of working out whether this is his Lord's. And, P and Jesus responds, come. And so Peter, he takes that step out of the boat and he walks towards Jesus. And I love this moment so much. I love it because I think there's encouragement, isn't there, in it, that as we seek our God, as we try to recognize his voice, Ultimately, when Jesus says, come, we kind of, we, we learn to sort of respond to it. We know, we know, we learn to sort of see that he is our good, good shepherd who is leading us into good things. It says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So Peter, he lets go of that safety net of the boat, doesn't he? And he takes that step towards Jesus. He is drawn to the adventure. He's drawn to the challenge. And he's drawn to, ultimately, closeness with his gods. And he's doing this totally dependent on the Spirit. Totally dependent on the Spirit. He knows in his own strength. You know, he can't defy the laws of physics and nature and kind of go walking on water. But with Jesus, he can do anything. He can step into the supernatural, can't he? He can live a life which goes from the ordinary to the extraordinary. 
He can tap into the resources of heaven. He can go against the grain of the boat dwellers and embrace that spirit of adventure. What an exciting picture of faith and a life fully surrendered to Jesus. And what, you know, what does that say to you? What would that look like for you? As the storms rage around you, as life can get a bit rocky and our circumstances somewhat tumultuous and news, <laughs> we just got to look at the news and all of a sudden it's all spinny spin. As a people, though, like pursuing a God who shows up, do we trust in the God that passes by? Do we trust in our Lord that passes by? Are we on the lookout for him? You know, do we question, do we discern, like Peter discerned, is this you, Lord? If it is, like, tell me to come, and I'll come. What does it look like for you guys to discern the voice of God? And where might you sense Jesus saying, come? Where might you sense him saying that? It could be anything. Big, small, maybe a small step out of the boat, maybe a gigantic leap. Where might you sense him saying that to you? Maybe that is handing in a job application, which you know it's going to take you out of your comfort zone. Maybe that is a hard conversation with a friend where you feel like this could go one of two ways, but I feel like I've got to go there to sort of level up in the relationship. <laughs> um, maybe it's giving some money away. You don't want to because, you know, we all know we're heading into sort of economically interesting times and you want to cling to financial security, but you sense Jesus saying, actually, there's this needy cause out there that I want you to give to. Maybe it's a gigantic leap. Has anyone seen the John Lewis Christmas advert? Yeah, I'm just saying, I'm not going to give it away. Watch it, see what it does to your heart. <laughs> hey, I'm just leaving that one out there in the ether. It's a good one, it's a good one. Marty, he sat me down and he's like, Helen, you've got to watch this, it's going to make you cry. And I was like, it's not going to make me cry, nothing makes me cry, because I'm quite hard not to crack when it comes to TV. It made me cry. Um... How about getting real about our faith? How about getting real about our faith? For me, like, this is where I feel challenged. You know, it's, it feels a risky business, doesn't it, to be real with our faith, with, with those who especially don't claim to have one. And, and I've had some times where I put myself out there when it comes to being real around my relationship with God, and it's not gone well, and it's been a bit disappointing, and I felt the sort of sting of rejection and hurt, and people thinking I'm some brainwashed nutter. <laughs> and at times I've thought, maybe I am like a brainwashed nutter. <laughs> but, you know, I, I really sense Jesus saying, Helen, don't give up. Don't give up. And letting this world know how much I ridiculously love it. Don't give up. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. And so I don't want to give up with it. And I actually had a cool moment around it the other day. So I met this lady at my gym. And um, she was cool. We got chatting. And she had this holiday cottage by the coast. And she let me and um, Marty, my husband, and kids stay in it. And we had this glorious holiday. The sun shone. It was in the summer. In this cute little chalet. It was a bunch of, there was a bunch of other chalets there. A um, little park. And then we could go on a little potter out to the beach. It was wonderful. But a few days in, we met this mean lady. She was on, because of some complicated holiday chalet politics, she was really unpleasant to us, like seriously, and unpleasant to my kids. I was like, okay, be unpleasant to me is one thing, but my kids, no. And it kind of like started to spoil the holiday a bit. It, I mean, even the kids, the kids named her the mean lady, and they kind of made it a bit of a game to run away from the mean lady. But anyway, there was one morning when I was particularly riled up about it. I was like, oh, we've, we need a holiday, man, and this mean lady is totally ruining it. And... We got into the car, and I was like, okay, I need to be Christian about this. And so I was like, teachable moment. I was like, kids, I know you're real calling out the mean lady right now, but we need to say a prayer of forgiveness. So we said a prayer of forgiveness, even though it kind of felt a bit token because we still called on the mean lady. But anyway, we were trying to press into what it looked like to forgive this lady. Anyway, I went back to, we, had, we didn't let it ruin the holiday. We cracked on. It was a wonderful time. And I went to hand back some keys to my gym lady friend. I said, Here's some keys. Thank you for letting us rent this wonderful place. We had a gorgeous time by the coast. 
just a little bit of feedback. We met the mean lady. <laughs> she was really unpleasant to us, la, 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 la. I just thought she needed to know. Um, and I could see in my gym lady friend, oh, it sort of hit a nerve. And she was like, I know this lady. And she started taking notes. And it, it kind of evolved that actually, yeah, it was quite a toxic thing that was going down. And then it felt, this is my little stepping out of the boat moment. I needed to sort of say something about that prayer in the car. And I was like, well, you know, we're Christians. And um, we actually prayed a prayer of forgiveness for this lady. Because, you know, we didn't want it to ruin a holiday. And we, we feel like, you know, God wants us to forgive people in life. So we said a prayer. And then my gym lady friend said, oh, my goodness. As you shared that, I went all tingly. And I was like, oh, my goodness. That's like the spirit. He's doing his tingly thing. And guys, like, my gym lady friend is unusually open. But I really feel like as you guys share about your faith, whether people let on or not, those tingles, they're going to be alive and kicking. <laughs> and so just, like, don't hold back. Like, the harvest is plentiful, Jesus says. Let's trust him with that. Anyway... It doesn't stop there. Sorry, I'm like, I've got to keep an eye on time. I was just seeing that. But it doesn't stop there because then I, um, I went to, um, back to my gym and there's a little, it's quite a nice gym. Uh, there's a little hotel lobby attached to it. And I saw my gym lady there. It was just a few months after. I was like, hey, gym lady friend. Sorry, I kind of feel like I need to keep some anonymous. Anonymity, I can't say that word. Anyway, so um, I was like, how are you doing? She was having a coffee with her other friend. And she's like, I'm not doing well. I'm feeling really anxious. And, and this mean lady, she's like really kicking off with the holiday chalet situation. And that's got me really fired up and angry. And look at the news, Helen. Look, it's like a flipping Muppet show. I think the prime minister thing was going down at the time. So she was like, look. But she was like genuinely frightened about it. She was genuinely frightened about it. And she was like, but well, you know what? I'm starting to believe that maybe there's a God. I was like, this never happens to me. It never happens to me. And she's like, actually, like, could you just like say one of those prayers you're talking about? I was like, what? Right here, right now? And she's like, yeah, right here, right now. I was like, okay. So then I looked at to, to her friend. I was like, well, you're a Christian. Do you, do you want to say a prayer? So I'm not a Christian, but I'll say a prayer. And her friend, it was so cute. She put her hands out like this. So we literally entered. We entered into this gorgeous little prayer circle in my hotel, the hotel lobby of my gym. And it was amazing. And it's, I kind of feel like it's worth all those pangs of rejection and hurt and disappointment to be living in a water, walk, water walking moment with Jesus like that. Um, so guys, what, what does it look like for you to lean into the challenge of this passage? Where might you sense Jesus saying, come, and what things may you be clinging to? May, yeah, in, well, you're in the boat, and you don't really want to let go. What, what may those things be for you? Maybe, maybe that is financial security. Maybe that is caring too much about what people think of you. Maybe it's fear of failure. Fear of failure. When I was preparing this, I felt like actually some people in the room, fear of failure and getting things wrong, that's what gets in the way of you stepping out of the boat. But in this story, we see that, you know, Peter, he kind of fumbled in his little water-walking experience, and he, he looked down. He let his circumstance overwhelm him. And yet he calls out to Jesus, and Jesus saves him. Jesus saves him. And he says, you know, he looks Peter in the eye, and he's like, you know, you don't need to lack faith, Peter. You don't need to lack faith. Remember who I said I am. Remember, it is I. It is I. It is I, you know... The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It is I, like the God who flung stars into space and who spoke the world into being. It is I who turned water into wine and heals the sick. It is I, it's your Lord and your friend, Peter. You don't need to be afraid right now. You don't need to be afraid. Trust me, Peter, trust me. I reckon they would have had a real little moment then. And quite often when I've read this passage, I felt like, you know, P, you know, Peter has been this brave disciple by stepping out of the boat. And here Jesus is calling out, calling him out for not having enough faith. Um, and I'm like, Jesus, come on, give him some slack. At least he was the only one to get out of the boat. <laughs> but actually, when I, reread, when I sort of reread it this time around, I, I kind of think, no, I think when Jesus said things to his disciples, when he says things to us, he says them with grace. And truth, he says, he brings a challenge, but he brings it with immense love. And I think Peter, he would have, you know, he would have come out of this experience, not with a sense of fail failing, but with a sense of, yeah, kind of 
being built in faith and trust in his God. And so like, as I want to land tonight, and just before I bring up my friend, I also kind of want to say that, um, yeah, as I, as I was reading, as I was kind of reading this book especially, I felt like God gave me like this gentle pitch in the equation too. That yes, we want to lean into the challenge of this passage. We want to live that adventurous kind of faith-filled life with God. But as I was reading it, there was a chapter called Boat Potatoes. It's a good book. This isn't a criticism on, criticism on the book. But, uh, yeah, but Boat Potatoes. And I was reading this, and I kind of, it was all about how, you know, well done, Peter. He got out of the boat, but the rest of the disciples, they were a bit lame. They chickened out. And, and he was sort of, Ortberg was, he was challenging a bit of a comfort, lazy streak in the church, which, you know, I kind of feel like is a needy challenge at points. But the picture God gave me was of someone in the boat, and they were frightened, and they were scared. Maybe they were quite ill and exhausted. And they were quite incapacitated to step out of the boat. And I sensed the Father God coming down, coming next to that person, saying, it's okay. You don't need to feel the pressure of this right now. I've got it. I'm with you. You know, just lean into my arms right now. Surrender to the rest. And so I guess that's what I want to land with tonight, that, yeah, yeah. Let's lean into the challenge of this, but let's also just surrender to the, the, those times when Jesus is calling us to rest too. And I think this is a challenge for me. Like as someone you may have sensed, I'm like all about the challenge and striving. And, <laughs> but I sometimes need to be obedient to God and just embrace the rest too. Um, and when, when my kids started school... I had this like identity crisis, like, oh my goodness, I need to make something of my life. And I started applying for jobs, left, right, and center, and tried to write a book and all sorts. And I just sensed God in the midst of it all saying, just, just rest. It's your season to rest. Go get yourself a gym membership and flop in the hot tub and watch Strictly Come Dancing and knit. And I had to do the same to my husband. I was like, it's okay, Marty. Like, you don't always have to be doing Bible studies in the morning. It's okay if you want to just lie on the sofa and watch Match of the Day. Like, I'm, I'm such a good wife, aren't I? Sending my, husband. <laughs> Sending my husband off to watch Match of the Day. But I guess that's what I wanted to say. Like, let's lean into the challenge of this. But also kind of just appreciate those seasons and those times, even within the week, whether that's kind of those times to rest in the week or those yearly rhythms, just to, um, yeah, surrender to the rest too. Thank you.